Hi there. I am inside of a Jupyter Notebook, and in this video I would like to talk about a somewhat counterintuitive remedy when it comes to seeing metrics that might make you feel too optimistic. But let's first explain the setup. What I'm doing over here is I'm fetching a data set from the OpenML repository, and the main thing that's important to know is that this is a data set that has a class imbalance issue. This is a data set about fraud, and you can definitely imagine that the number of non-fraud cases far, far, far exceed the number of fraud cases. If I were to take the mean of this binary array that contains the labels, then you can see that about two tenths of a percent of all the instances have a positive label. So for sure, this is a class imbalance issue, pretty much the textbook example. Still, we typically want to build machine learning pipelines to be able to predict this sort of a thing, and that's what's happening below over here. I have a pipeline that's a fairly standard one. It's a standard scalar followed up by a logistic regression, so nothing fancy is really happening here just yet. And after that, I am calling this cross val predict method over here. Now, this function does deserve a little bit of an explainer. What it effectively does is it makes a cross validation as you would normally. So imagine this is your X and Y data set, then you still want to be able to cut this data set up into a train segment and into a test segment, if you will. But the way this cross fell predict works is that when we do this split, it is going to use a estimator that is passed to produce the predictions for the test set. It is going to do this not once, but for every single cross validation that we make. And in doing so, you kind of get these sets of predictions that really are cross-validated predictions, in a sense that if we were to calculate metrics on these, that we would still be able to get metrics out from test sets, and that we wouldn't get metrics from train sets. I am going for five cross-validations here, so this is still relatively standard stuff. But the main important thing is that I have my predictions over here, and that I can do metric things with them. And that's actually something I'm doing in the cell right below. I'm taking my predictions, these would be zeros and ones that I predict, and I would be comparing that to the actual labels. And as you can see, if I were to calculate the mean, which is, I'm checking how often the predictions actually match what I'm trying to predict, then I can see that I've got a staggeringly high accuracy score over here. This is a nearly perfect accuracy score. Now, when you see something like this, you should have mental alarm bells going off right away. Part of the story here is that given the imbalance, accuracy might not be the best metric. But the most important thing is that you shouldn't become overly optimistic when you see something like this. More often than not, when you get a near-perfect accuracy score, even on the test set, it suggests that something is happening under the hood that you should be aware of. Now, one remedy that you can have against this is to actually maybe look at more than just a single metric. In particular, the classification report that we've mentioned in the previous video can really help out here. You can pass it your true labels, and you can pass it your predictions. When you do this, you get a bit more of a nuanced view. By looking at these label statistics over here, you can get the impression that the only reason why we have such a ludicrously high accuracy score, that's because we're able to predict the zero class very, very well. We seem to be doing kind of okay on this class over here, but given that this might be the class that is of most interest, we actually get a bit of a glimpse on what could be done to improve the situation. So looking at other metrics and using this classification report, might be a thing that's worth doing, that can definitely help you take the required step back and walk the path towards making a better system. But there's also a quote-unquote dumb solution that also tends to help in situations like this. And that would be to use a dummy model. So what you can do is you can go to the scikit-learn dummy submodule, and inside of that, you have two dummy models. You've got a regressor and a classifier. Since we're dealing with classification right here, I'm just gonna go for the dummy classifier for now. And I'm just gonna instantiate a dummy classifier. What I'm now going to do is I'm basically just going to copy this cross fell predict line. I'm gonna drop it down below over here. And I'm just gonna calculate the same thing, but for my dummy classifier. Now, one thing that's immediately interesting is that when I run this, this cell is actually pretty darn quick. And that is because there's barely any training happening inside of this function. This dummy classifier that we have over here, 
does a prediction that is really, really naive. And you can learn more by looking at the doc string. The dummy classifier makes predictions that truly ignore the input features. It is really just looking at the label to make a very basic prediction. It depends a bit on the strategy that you pass. And if I were to scroll down here, we can have a look at different strategies that are available. And in particular, this prior strategy over here, that is the default. If you don't pass anything extra, this will be the strategy that'll be used on your behalf. In which case, the predict method will always return the most frequent class in the observed Y argument during the fit phase. This is very similar to the most frequent strategy that's listed above, by the way. It's just that when you use this strategy, it also has an effect on the predict proba of the method. That last bit is in essence a bit of a detail, but the main thing that this classifier will do is it will just go ahead and always predict zero. And you can confirm that by just looking at this array of predictions. It's zeros everywhere. So if I were now to calculate the mean between the predictions from my dummy model, and if I were to compare that to the true labels, well, when I do that, I also get a model that performs very, very well. I guess it is pretty interesting to see that, although it is a very marginal difference, you can see that this model over here does perform a little bit better. But the main observation here is that, hey, if we have a machine learning model that we train that's looking at the data like above, then for sure whatever number I get out over here should totally outperform the metrics of a dummy classifier. And if that's not the case, then you might argue that your classification approach isn't really performing that well. Sure, you might try to convince yourself with a high accuracy number, but if you get a very similarly high accuracy number by using a dummy model, then you have a very good reason to doubt the system. And you can look at that as a insurance policy of sorts. Just for good measure, let's also have a quick look at the classification report. As expected, you can see that we never predict the class one over here. And it's also kind of interesting to see how the macro average prediction scores over here are pretty dang low. But the main observation with regards to using this dummy classifier is that you could look at this model as the simplest model ever that you should be able to outperform. Dummy classifier really isn't doing anything intelligent. So whenever you have a system that doesn't perform significantly better, you can for sure start getting a bit suspicious. As mentioned before, we also have a dummy regression model in case you're doing regression tasks. And in the dummy regressor situation, we're not dealing with the most frequent class. Instead, you'll be picking the mean or the median or some aggregate of the y variable that you're predicting. It's pretty much the same idea from there on forward, it's just that regressors are a little bit different than classifiers internally. I should immediately say that while the idea of the dummy classifier is indeed very sound, the dummy classifier should just be seen as a very basic, simple benchmark that you should for sure be able to beat. That on its own can be useful, but in a more real life scenario, I would really recommend you to also try to come up with your own benchmark that doesn't require a dummy model at all. Maybe if you have a data frame, let's say, you could also maybe do a very simple group by, just group over some categories that you know of, and then calculate the mean to make a prediction of sorts. The main lesson of the dummy classifier, at least in my mind, isn't so much that it's a very useful model. It is more that benchmarking against defaults can be a great idea, if only because they help you remain a little bit skeptical of what's happening, but also because it's a fairly simple thing to check for as you're starting to build your first models.